Welcome to the Connecting to Reimagine Money and COVID-19 webinar. Today, we are talking about financial fragility during a pandemic, and we have an extraordinary group of speakers to do so. And as we witness the long line at the food banks and the suffering that this crisis is imposing, is imposing on so many families around the world, it's just so important and timely to talk about uh, the financial fragility of many households around the world. Um, I will start asking some questions uh, to this group of speakers, but uh, we will also turn to the question to some of you. So make sure to already start thinking of this question and add it, uh, them to the Q&A. Uh, Peter, I'm actually going to start with you and uh, I'm going to bring us back to the uh, previous crisis, actually, the crisis of 2007 and 2008. Also, that imposed quite a shock to the families back then and see what we can learn from that crisis and how we can think about financial fragility, because this is actually when we started thinking of financial fragility. So I have to say, I remember so vividly um, the visit at Harvard Business School and actually going to visit this famous professor of finance that in his elegant and wooded panel office at HBS was not thinking about how to asset price derivative or do asset pricing, but was thinking about how do we help families and in particular low income families manage risk what are the instruments and what are the tools that we can provide to families? I thought I was in the right place uh, and that it was really true that HBS was, you know, ahead of everybody else. And so can we discuss again together, you know, how can we help, for example, family, but in particular, let's start with financial fragility. How, how can we measure how families are doing and what can we learn you know, from that crisis uh, so to do better uh, and understand better this crisis? So Anna, thank you for that kind introduction and thank you for being our partner in crime for these many, many years. Uh, you know, we did in fact start this work you know, more than a decade ago. And if we take it further back, I was trying to reflect on this for tonight, um, or at least for tonight for me, um, this work for me started in 1999 when I started to look at how it is that families were dealing with the financial system. Um, I, my background was in financial engineering and financial institutions, but what was missing was a really deep understanding of how families were faring. Um, and that's in the dot-com bubble. And then, and then as we moved into the financial crisis. And in, in, as you may recall, in 2008, and nine. Um, we started to think about how would we get our arms around a measure of financial fragility? Could we ask people how much money they had or what did they have in the bank um, or you know, what their expenses were? And each of these measures seemed insufficient. And then we came up with what seemed to be an overly simplistic set of questions or a question that we used is, can you come up with? And you know, in the US, we said $2,000 because that was the amount that after doing some research was a car a major car repair or a dental uh, emergency. Um, and shockingly at the time we found that half of Americans or roughly half of Americans said they could not easily come up with or come up with at all $2,000 in 30 days. And this began an odyssey, you know, is that a, a, a real question and, and what other phenomena is it related to? We found that this self-professed financial fragility was related to people's decisions about when they wanted to get married um, when they plan to retire. And in a paper that you and I wrote with our often co-author, Daniel Schneider, you know, when they actually, when they saw healthcare. Um, and so this very simple concept of financial fragility um, has proven to be quite robust in future work. I also showed that it was related to how they thought about financial protection and government uh, protection of their finances. So the notion of financial fragility has been around at least for a decade in the work that we've done. And, uh, you know, we would have hoped that in this inexorable, um, you know, path that it would have gotten better and it did get better for a while, but uh, COVID has blown a hole in the financial lives of uh, Americans and Europeans and people in Britain as well, um, which is what we're gonna to explore tonight. Yeah. Thank you. 
And Maria, you have also worked on financial fragility and this time in the context of Europe and the European Union. So um, now back to you, how, how do you define financial fragility and what are the findings uh, about financial fragility now in the European context? Oh, thank you, uh, Anna. Uh, good evening, all uh, from Brussels. Um, uh, yes, Anna, we have uh, done uh, 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 actually a, a research, uh, you know, motivated very much by the, the shutdown and what would that mean for the households. Uh, surprisingly, uh, something that I didn't know is that uh, the European Statistical Authority actually carries a survey uh, which asks very much the question that uh, that Peter uh, outlined earlier on, uh, but uh, slightly slightly different to fit um, the differences in purchasing power among the different countries, and effectively asks households to self-assess whether they would be capable to indeed come up uh, with an amount that would meet an unexpected expense. And you know, by unexpected expense, we don't mean something huge. Uh, we mean something that is likely, like an appliance that breaks down at home or a car repair, the sorts of uh, the same things that Peter outlined. Uh, but the number that it refers to varies from country to country. In Spain, for example, that amount, the equivalent of $2,000 that Peter said, would be around 750 euro. In the UK, it's about 100 pounds. But it applies to similar types of things, meeting up an unexpected expense. Uh, so we were very glad to see that the statistical authorities monitor this in, in an annual survey that they do. And we do have data data that go back to 2009. Um, and so the last point observation that we have is 2018, which is of course before uh, the pandemic, and it gives us an idea of how well prepared in the context of financial fragility um, uh, Europeans were coming into the, into the pandemic. The, 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 the results we found were quite surprising uh, in, in the sense that the numbers, at least in my, in my mind, they were bigger than I would have, would have hoped. About one in three households in the European Union, that includes the UK, um, are uh, you know, financially fragile. And there are huge discrepancies between countries. There are some countries for which more than one in two households you know, self-assess themselves as financially fragile all the way down to one in 10 households in the richest countries. And, you know, the results, the other results that we find are, you know, they're typically uh, and aligned with the things that you have, you and Peter and others have found in, in your research in the US. Uh, families with children are typically more vulnerable. Although interestingly, for some countries, some poorer countries, we found that actually it would be the um, the family with uh, uh, with children are more robust, uh, financially speaking, and that has got something to do with the amounts of people that have left the country. These are typically countries for which we have very high levels of migration. This is something that at this point is speculative, but this is what we suspect this is going. And again, that single people and indeed women are more vulnerable. Um, a few things that are also a bit surprising and maybe interesting in the context of comparing uh, European countries to the US is that uh, we found some breaks of correlation between per capita income, between rich countries and predictability of uh, financial fragility. By that I mean that there was a couple of, of rich countries, and rich I mean per capita income rich, that self-declared themselves financially fragile. Um, those countries were countries that were very badly hit during the financial crisis, and we suspect that this is a remnant of, of this very big shock that they faced uh, even 10 years ago. And then the last thing I will say is that indebtedness uh, is not a good predictor for financial fragility. We find that those countries that are very highly indebted are also the richest countries, and the ones for which households do not self-declare financially fragile. Um, and, uh, you know, I remind you that uh, the, uh, the bulk of debts in, in European households uh, is uh, allocated to mortgages, so it's related to households. Um, uh, there is very little consumer uh, credit that uh, European households have. And more than anything else, I think indebtedness in the European Union uh, uh, is, is a measure of financial sophistication and of availability uh, of, uh, of credit more than actually financial uh, fragility. Uh, these are pretty much the results of uh, this exercise we did. We can come back to what this all means coming into the pandemic. So it seems, uh, let me turn to Billy now, you know, it seems that first of all, many families had not recovered even from the previous crisis, even though it was such a long time, right, uh, after that crisis. And, and Billy, you have done 
you know, uh, not just uh, uh, in supported work, uh, that also look at some of the qualitative uh, evidence and studies so we can understand a little bit more the nuances um, and the, you know, what are family doing uh, and what does financial fragility means. Um, so tell us a little bit more also, you know, because these are not just numbers, right? This is, there are people behind these figures and as Peter and also Maria have mentioned, you know, it, it really has an effect on the choices and then what people do. Uh, that's right, Anna, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, we, we've been trying to be as responsive as possible this year as an organization, a data-driven organization, uh, to, to understand what is going on in the households in, uh, with American families. And, you know, our data are limited to U.S. households, but um, the, the percent that are financially fragile is very similar to some of the numbers that, uh, that Maria mentioned in Europe. Uh, but what we've done this year, we've We've polled families twice in, in direct uh, correlation, excuse me, direct surveys tied to um, the COVID crisis and the financial stress that's being caused by that. And then we also do an annual survey on uh, financial setbacks that we've been doing for several years now. And to paint a picture of what's going on, I have to start with, with a couple of points of data here that are startling, uh, to say the least, in terms of uh, not like anything I've seen before. Um, we, we surveyed American households in April of 2020 and in September of 2020, and we looked at uh, are you, we ask questions like, are you financially stressed? 88% uh, of all households said that they are financially stressed as a direct uh, uh, relationship to the COVID crisis and what was going on with the economy uh, and healthcare and so forth at the time. And to get a number that high um, is almost, you know, it, it, it's almost impossible to go down any cul-de-sac, uh, any street in America without finding the majority of those homes uh, affected by this. And what's happening in the home is the story here, the qualitative story of what's going on. Um, over half of, of Americans felt uh, the stress coming from not having enough saved um, and being able to pay the bills. Almost half of Americans were stressed that they could not or worried that they could not pay the bills. And so what they're doing is they're cutting expenses. They're, uh, they've pulled back in their ability to contribute to retirement uh, savings. Um, uh, you know, when, you, when you're looking at 40% of Americans who are cutting their monthly expenses and cutting contributions to things like the emergency um, that could happen, uh, job job ending, um, uh, being able to cover uh, and help a family member. Those things are all paramount and what's uh, front and center with, with, with families and with the children. Uh, we're seeing this also happening with, with children coming home from college uh, and the ties to that. Uh, but what's even more troubling is the divergence in the racial inequity in the U.S. right now. Uh, the fact that uh, the number of people making adjustments, uh, white homes making adjustments is much lower uh, than uh, Black and uh, Latinx families. We're almost at 90 percent of African-American and Black households that are making financial adjustments uh, compared to 70 percent of, of white households. So when, when we're already seeing financial fragility play itself out among racial lines, among gender lines, among geographic regions, uh, it is amplified even more so uh, to those that are most financially fragile. And as we've done the survey and did follow-up data on this a little bit later uh, in September, um, uh, things started looking a little better for higher income families, but much worse for lower income families. And to be able to sustain that over time, uh, you know, every year we do the survey on financial setbacks. And, and the range is sort of 68 to 72 percent of homes are, are, are going to face some sort of financial setback. And sometimes it's, you know, it, it's tied to a repair or something going on in the home. This year, it's 24 percent of those surveyed. Uh, it's job loss. And so the, fin uh, the financial stress is one thing, but the ripples of that, what, the, the, the psychological stress that's happening and the ability to cover that. And let's not forget the emergency funds, the fact 
fact that this has been going on for around nine months now. Uh, even the best laid plans of nine months emergency savings for those who have been laid off that long, they are they are likely out of, of savings at this point. So it it's a stressful sort of dire situation in many uh, millions of homes. Thank you, Billy. Actually, so fast forward, Peter, let's come back to you because, uh, you know, as Billy has said, the situation now seems dire. And, uh, you know, now you have actually uh, come back to uh, this project, but this time looking at data during the pandemic. And in fact, uh, looking at data type frequencies, uh, you know, the data is up to, you know, November and the beginning of December now. So let's look at the situation now and uh, perhaps even the different measure that have been used now to measure how, how families are doing. And now let's talk about also potential recommendation, you know, like what's going on and what can we do? So, you're, you know, you've already kind of laid this out. We've been in the field every four weeks since the late spring. Uh, the most recent wave uh, came from November. And we're, we're measuring a number of things. For example, a measure that spending exceeds income, unable to pay bills on time, little to no savings for short-term needs and financial stress. And to connect what uh, Maria said and what Billy said, you know, there are cross-sectional differences for sure. Women do worse than men, low-income people do worse, you know, uh, minorities do worse, uh, and we'll get to the unemployed and uh, lower educated people do worse than we'll do unemployed in a second. Um, and in each of those cases, we observed at the beginning, you know, kind of pretty substantial differences on those dimensions. Um, and as the days got shorter from June to uh, now, um, what we're seeing is really this tr very, very troubling uh, spread in these kind of dimensions. We look at, you know, whether it's on educational grounds or income grounds, the difference between the haves and the have-nots with respect to these measures of financial fragility, they're just blowing out, quite honestly. And whereas maybe, you know, the days will get shorter until December 21st, and then they'll start to get longer again, we don't see any natural um, break in this unless something happens. In addition, what we looked at in particular is we looked at the status of the unemployed relative to those who are employed. And what we saw through the summer when the pandemic uh, unemployment compensation provisions of the CARE Act were in place, was that the, the difference between the unemployed and employed um, were actually fairly small and fairly stable. And then when the PUC uh, conditions uh, expired, and so that those funds were no longer available to the unemployed in the United States, we started to see this widening, this huge widening between the financial fragility of employed and unemployed. And I think that, Billy, I, I think you said you had done your, your, uh, your work in September, you know, going from September to October to November, and our, I think our last wave was mid-November, we're just seeing these numbers get out of hand, and I, I'm really afraid of what's going to happen in December. Um, and so, Anna, you said, what can be done? Well, the one thing that can be done quickly is we hope that uh, the government, uh, the U.S. government, um, will uh, find some way to uh, deal, you know, in, in Washington uh, in the way that they had through the CARES Act uh, to break the deadlock there so that you know, we're providing short-term relief to folks. That's not a long-run solution to the financial fragility that we see, but, you know, I really worry very, very much, especially we know that families, sometimes they prioritize things like holidays and their kids and Christmas. This is going to be a very cold January if, you know, we're going into it this way and people are trying to maintain the semblance of, of, uh, of normality for their families. Um, thank you. Um, the situation is indeed a dire. Um, and Maria, so you had um, mentioned and told us that uh, families were already fragile entering into the pandemic. So let's go back to now discussing policy recommendation in Europe as well. What is your recommendation for the policymakers? Yeah, um, perhaps I could tell you a little bit of what has been done as we come into the uh, into the pandemic as a response to the uh, basically to the shutdown, to the close of all businesses. And I think there the, there were two things that uh, uh, 
were very actively and consciously done with the aim of preserving value for households. And that is the following. The first one is um, there has been a, a moratorium on all delinquencies. In other words, the government came in and said, we will not allow any firm to go bust. And we, we will only allow, they would not allow them to go bust. We want them to continue to work. So they sort of postponed those firms or anybody who was going to ask for delinquency or bankruptcy, they would not be allowed to go bankrupt. And the second one that was done is that to, to the extent that, uh, that businesses actually were underperforming, they were not operating as much as they ought to be because simply there is no demand, um, the government would subsidize those firms to keep people in employment. So rather than giving money out for unemployment benefits, uh, all the governments in Europe in a very concentrated effort have uh, asked uh, firms to keep people in employment and sponsor that. Um, and that, of course, has got a, a number of interesting implications. Uh, uh, they, um, the, uh, primarily the psychological uh, shock of coming out of uh, uh, employment in rather rough conditions. To the extent that people did lose uh, income, there was additional support coming from, uh, uh, from the government, a percentage, not the full thing, to try and top up what, this, uh, uh, what the losses were. So here, the, if I say, the, the efforts were to try and maintain purchasing power for the households. And knowing that households are financially fragile of the order that I mentioned um, uh, in my previous comments, uh, the, the, the efforts here were trying to preserve the income for the countries, so that for the for the household, so they can pursue, uh, they maintain the standard of living to the same extent. Now, um, the, the, we don't have the new numbers on the financial fragility. This will take some time to uh, to come. And I remind you that when we do a survey in Europe, we have to do it in 20 different languages. So it's not it's not an easy <laughs> exercise to do. So it, it's, a, it's a very timely data. It's not as quick as it is in, uh, in the US. Um, we do observe from macro data, very similar trends as those that Peter uh, talked about, you know, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, the poorer uh, households were the, more, the ones that were hit the most in terms of losing employment again women the low educated we do have macro data on this that give us a very similar story uh, and we do have some rise in inequality uh, during the uh, uh, during the pandemic uh, but uh, beyond that um, the other thing that we observe is that we have a number of bankruptcies today that are very, very much, much lower than what would the normal number of bankruptcies would have been, which basically means that there is government guarantees that sustains activity. You know, it may be good news for financial fragility, but I don't know whether this is good news in the long run, because how long can we sustain this when effectively we finance all of this uh, through increases in uh, government debt? So for the moment, we have, I would say, better news than the ones we hear from the U.S., um, uh, but, you know, uh, the, the uh, attention now is to try and... Uh, um, combat the pandemic as quickly as possible, because financial support coming from the center, namely from the states, um, is not going to be, it's not going to be forever. Yeah. So let's actually go back to this topic of inequality that Maria has already mentioned, Billy, and you had already also emphasized. So what can thought leaders do to address some of these in inequities and inequality we are witnessing as a result of this pandemic? Well, uh, you know, there's there's a story here. It's it's two sides of a of a similar or the same coin, if you will. Um, some people are taking it upon themselves to just dig in and and help their neighbors, help their friends, help their families. And if you can find these glimmers of hope in the midst of the the tragedy that's going on uh, uh, with 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 people's lives as well as their financial life. It's the fact that almost half of Americans are helping others, whether that be uh, financial support, whether that be volunteering through nonprofits, things like the food banks we mentioned earlier. Uh, there's long lines for services and there are equally long lines of volunteers who are trying to help. So I, I think that comes from a place of wanting to help, wanting to give back. And we're seeing this um, uh, really compound and, and be a, a major component of what people are, are embracing right now in this moment. Um, but in, in the fact that uh, ethnic differences are seen in these data, you know, uh, people from uh, black households, people from Latinx households are more likely to actually support 
uh, their neighbors and their family and their friends uh, financially or through you know providing child care, uh, volunteer services, support, food, uh, and so forth. Um, and so these communities are trying to take care of each other. Uh, that's one step of many. Uh, access is another issue in the U.S. Uh, the fact that even learning how to start over, even learning how to rebuild your life financially after going through this, after going through a job loss, uh, uh, hours cut, uh, wages, and all the all of the sad data that we're seeing, uh, how do you start over? How do you build back? How do you begin to save again? Um, access is important here. Uh, the fact that um, uh, predominant uh, schools that are predominantly uh, students of color, uh, only 4% of those students are, attend a school that has personal finance as a required course compared to much higher numbers for wealthier and wider school districts. So if we can remove the barrier to access to be able to learn this topic, access to a local financial planner or a financial counselor in your community who serves your community, you know, we're working to try to remove those barriers as an organization. We're a small organization. We can't achieve that alone, but but creating better on-ramps to services, better on-ramps to education, and then policy where the, you know, the fairness of equal pay. And, you know, you can, you can be financially literate, but if you don't have access to a quality job uh, or, or a fair paying job, then, you know, what you know, you can't be applied. So um, let's, let's begin to create on-ramps for participation, let's remove the barriers to access and help people navigate the financial system in a way that works for them. Um, th those are policy uh, initiatives. I think that's uh, the way to touch most folks. And if you're gonna reach every young person in this country, then you're gonna have to do that through captive audience and that means school. Thank you so much. Now we are in the part of the webinar of the, the path forward. So as we look to the future, um, you know, how, how can we make families stronger? How can we uh, make them better prepare for the next crisis, for the next shock? So, you know, how can we reimagine a future where families are more financially resilient? So Peter, I'm, I'm, you know, as a dean of a premier business school, global business school, what is your recommendation and bold ideas for leaders? So before I'm a dean of a business school, I'd like to give the research that we did at the organization I founded, Build Commonwealth in January. So before COVID hit, we were looking at financial fragility. And this will work into answering your question, Anna. I'll get to the exam question. Um, you know, first we ask people fundamentally, Whose fault is this? I mean, we asked it in a much more elegant way. Is it the individual fault or is it systemic? And it was really interesting across America, diff people differed about whether it's basically blame the victim, you know, the financially fragile person or the system. Most people acknowledged it's a combination of both. And then the second set of questions in a coarse way that we asked is not whose fault is it, but who do we need to solve this problem? Is it an individual problem? Is it, you know, the NGOs and the in the you know the civil sector that Billy was talking about, is it employers or and and corporations or is it the government? And obviously, you can imagine how different people looked at that. Um, but I think a lot of the results, um, apart from those who thought that it really wasn't systemic, systemic, were looking to the government and to the corporate sector for solutions. So if we're looking for big, bold ideas, I think that's where we're gonna to have to go. And on the government side, let's think about things for a moment. You know, we have preferenced, for example, uh, retirement savings. But what we find with financial fragility is it's not an absence of retirement savings, it's, a retire it's an absence of emergency savings. So what sorts of things can we do at a government level to either prop up emergency savings, to incentivize emergency savings, to support emergency savings? And one experiment that we've done again, at buildcommonwealth.org, is working with UPS and other firms and getting some exemptions from the government, build, a, build corporate programs that actually provide motivation for employees to save for emergencies. So that's just an example. So how can the corporate sector be leveraged here? I think the other thing we have to recognize is, is that some of what we're seeing is an imbalance between income and expenses. We can tell people to spend less and that's gonna be part of the problem, but we have to get wages up. And, and uh, you know, we all know the statistics there the labor share of the economy has been going down over the last 20, 30 years, and the real returns and kind of real wages have been actually stagnated for most of Americans. We're gonna to have to deal with that. 
Those are big and bold things, and that's government sector things. But I think as the dean of a business school, I also look at what can the corporate sector do, the big corporate sector and the entrepreneurial sector. The big corporate sector, we know that there's a, a lot of work or at least a lot of interest in ESG or S is social factors. And a lot of the social factors are about how employers treat their workers. So what enlightened employment practices can corporations bring so that they're preferencing that stakeholder group relative to where they had preferenced them before? Um, you know, more than a year ago, the, the, uh, uh, the, the Business Roundtable had put out a statement saying that corporations in America were suddenly reawakening to the need to worry about all stakeholders and not only shareholders. So how do we turn that into reality? So as a thought experiment, one of the things that I wrote about with a, a, another colleague earlier in the year was, you know, if we think about dividends, dividends are payments to shareholders. Um, if they were stakeholder dividends, how would we redistribute some of that money to other stakeholders, including employees? Um, and then in terms of work practices. So I think you've got potential for big, bold ideas at the government level, big, bold ideas at the corporate level. And I think that in terms of uh, kind of the civil, civil society and households, I'm not sure they're gonna be big, bold ideas there. I think it's gonna be the hard work of controlling expenses a little bit, increasing income a little bit, investing in your own education to increase uh, your, your returns. But the, the kind of disparities we're seeing, the inequalities that we're seeing, they cannot be overcome by an individual or even by you know, a well-meaning you know, nonprofit. These are structural problems that have to be dealt with at a bigger place. Well, that leads us now to Maria. Um, so some big, bold ideas from you as well. These are indeed structural problems, right? They, they are not transitory problems. They are going to stay after the crisis if we don't address them. Yeah, I mean, I think the, perhaps I should start by saying that, you know, in the context of Europe, we have a very fixed idea about... Uh, what we want from the state. I mean, we really do uh, believe that the state needs to be there to, to help us out, uh, to pick up uh, when, you know, big shocks like the COVID shock, uh, admittedly a kind of an unexpected shock and, and one that who's, it's not nobody's fault. Um, and here, you know, Europeans have really always believed that the state should really be a kind of like a father who looks after the children. And, you know, there's a lot of money that goes into that and the expectation that, the, you know, the government, the, the state will actually support you in, uh, in difficult times, but also in good times as well, to, you know, from yourself, if you like. So I think that that is a that is a, a big thing by comparison to the US. In Europe, we will always turn to the state for these types of solutions. Interestingly, the numbers that I quoted in, in at the beginning of this uh, of this talk were showing us that despite having a very uh, careful and very benevolent state helping us out, there's still a lot of people that are financially fragile. So quite clearly, this isn't enough. We need uh, we need other solutions as well, and there have to be solutions that are more individual made and individually taken up. So, you know, things like financial literacy, things like uh, helping people understand that it's not just about savings for pensions, it's also the emergency savings that uh, Peter talked about. These types of things, the extent that they become uh, clear and come into the public dialogue, they can really help uh, prepare for the, un, uh, for the unexpected. Um, and one last thing, I'm a macroeconomist and, and, and I've always uh, argued, and this is how many times I've, I have discussions with you, Anna, about this. I believe that we need to look at the household as a, as a component of systemicness to the extent that we worry about financial stability in the, in the global sense. We should look at the household and how they contribute to financial stability, not only at banks or financial institutions or corporates, but also the household as a potential source of financial stability and that means we should measure it and we should measure it often and we should, we should look at how it goes up and how it comes down and what types of policies or, or initiatives uh, move this fragility one way or the other. So a stress test for families as well. We already have, a, we already have some recommendation for a policy maker. But Billy, um, how about recommendation for um, uh, leaders, visionary leader like you in the non-for-profit world, for example, what can be done? What are some bold ideas here? Well, you know, like my colleagues on the panel, uh, uh, one from a business school, one that's an economist, 
I'm an educator. Uh, I come from education. And so the, you know, the tenets of education are about improving knowledge, uh, improving access. You know, there's a lot of work in, in these things. And I think we can learn a lot from, uh, from the movements that are happening within education because we all live our financial lives within a personal finance ecosystem. And you take certain components from that ecosystem. You take a keystone contributor to that ecosystem and it collapses. So you need to find the balance here between um, just the component that we work in at the National Endowment for Financial Education, which is financial education, financial literacy research, you know, better understanding how people learn and, and building on competencies rather than rote memorization. That's a fundamental component to just improving that piece of the ecosystem. But we also need to be realistic and understand that in this ecosystem, there needs to be consideration for consumer protections, uh, access to financial products, inclusion in the job uh, market, uh, equal pay, uh, all of the components that create a healthy, um, uh, full uh, opportunity to participate in this. Whether you choose to uh, whatever choose uh, career you choose, uh, what the income level is, is that you understand how that creates sustainability for your life financially. And one thing that I uh, that we're doing uh, at our organization is trying to not only improve the pipeline of research and how do we measure financial literacy, how how are we how how have we excluded people from the opportunity to learn about the topic, um, all the way to trying to understand the balance that's needed to build this healthy ecosystem within which we all live our financial lives and to, and to steal from Anna, uh, how do we all become more efficient and better CFOs of our life? Um, and so that's how we're thinking about it. But we're trying to create more representation in the data, more representation in practice through funding, you know, scholarships and so forth. You know, we're a, we're a, we're a charity, we're a foundation. So we've provided opportunities for, for that to happen. Um, but I would like, and I would encourage our discipline and our community to learn uh, something else from, from our friends in education is that uh, this constant sort of dialogue about in the indictment of learning, but think about it uh, from a point of improvement. You know, we're constantly evaluating uh, and growing and learning. And that's the thing about paradigms and scientific research is we want to always understand and grow in that space. But let's let's pursue policy. Let's pursue educational interventions. Let's pursue consumer advocacy that's built from a growth mindset and that is built from uh, an opportunity to improve. It's not just about proving, but it's about improving. And so how can we do that? How can we uh, you know, we think, oh, we, we created an on-ramp for a particular group and we're finished. You know, let's hang our hats up and go home and have a martini and celebrate. Well, that's just one step of many. Thank you very much. Actually, I, there are lots of questions and uh, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to read three questions and then ask each of you to maybe answer, you know, one question, one of them uh, and so on with the possibility potentially to address uh, uh, a few you know, and so one of the question is about, you know, have we seen what can build some resilience uh, among families? You know, is it adding precautionary saving? Is it adding secure housing? Is it having a good community around us, as you were saying, Billy? You know, can, can we say a little bit more about, you know, how can we build resilience going forward? Right. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, uh, people, uh, and we have seen it, it's not that they are not facing this large crisis. Oft, often they cannot face an unexpected expense, right? And so um, how can we help people, in a sense, prepare better for the unexpected? And the unexpected seems to be a common feature of life, right? And I think that's also one learning uh, of how, how do we manage a risk and unexpected expenses? And then a third question that I know so many of us has asked about, which is, we see a disconnect here, um, you know, in the micro and macro. On the one hand, we see so many families suffering. On the one hand, on the other hand, we see the stock market shooting up. Um, so what does this disconnect tell us? So as we remember, rebuild and move forward, as we reimagine the future, what can we say about some of this topic? In other words, the question is, how can we help? 
a family be more uh, resilient and how can we help society be less unequal? And I leave it to, you know, like for you to pick one and maybe answer quickly to one of it. <clears throat> Peter, which one would you like? Oh, I'll do the resilience one. Okay. Um, so, um, and I'll just start because I'm sure others will have something to say about this. You know, in the research that we did, we asked people how they cope with emergencies. And there was a triage, you know, first it's my own savings. And then mm -hmm. secondly, and this is in virtually every country we looked at. Secondly, mm -hmm. it was my friends and family. Third was credit. Fourth was, and now we start to get different things. I work more hours, I sell stuff. Um, and so the first line of defense for any family in any country, and you know, I've an American who's lived in Europe for the last 10 years, and I can see the difference that Marie was talking about between a, a collectivist society and a more individualistic so society. But the first line of defense is individual savings. The second line of defense is, in fact, the social network. The third line of defense is, in effect, you know, the financial system that we all think about. So how do we build resilience? We come back to saying, you know, if the first line to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't breach, get breached is savings, we want to work on savings. And there's, if you think about that as a bathtub analogy, there's two ways to do that, income up or expenses down. Um, and it's not much more complicated than that. Income up would be the various ways that we can help people to get higher incomes and or to, uh, uh, or on the other side to spend less money. And often the government can be an important uh, contributor to both of those. I'm just gonna mention one small thing that's extraordinarily timely in the United States. Historically, Americans, especially low-income Americans, basically had this really uh, buffer policy of saving they never thought about, which was tax refunds. Virtually every American, low-income American, would get a huge tax refund, you know, roughly $2,000, you know, early in the new year. And what, you know, people are realizing now is that those refunds are not gonna come because people have not worked enough and therefore put enough into, you know, kind of prepaying their taxes in order to get the large refunds. And the big shock will come, I suspect, to many families who are saying, wait a minute, you know, this time of year, I get that big refund check to pay for, you know, Christmas and the holidays. And that's not gonna happen. So, you know, I'm really worried not only about the long-term issues, but what's gonna happen in January? Hopefully the Biden administration will have kind of been working through those sorts of issues. Um, but resilience, I think, comes from savings. Some of it's by the household, but this, what I'm talking about, earned income tax credit and other things, is for savings through the government. Thank you very much. We only have uh, a few minutes left and I'm going to add one more question so you can choose more. And when some people ask, how can we make financial education compulsory in school? I love this question and I need to ask you. So like literally, can you, uh, Maria and, and Billy, can you now answer one of these questions? And unfortunately just, you know, just uh, with the, uh, maybe one minute each. So we'll have one minute to say uh, happy holiday to all of you. Maria. May, if I may start, perhaps I should take the, uh, the disconnect question because it is a very economics question. And indeed, uh, um, you do observe that and uh, it, it looks puzzling. But if you, if you look at uh, what drives uh, the, 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 the stock market in the past six or seven months, it has been really the digital firms. Um, they are the ones whose uh, IPOs have really uh, been uh, increased and, and rather, you know, strikingly, as indeed uh, the question indicates. Um, it is the fact that we have all gone online, uh, you know, the very fact that we are using the technology right now. Uh, they, the certain digital products have become extremely um, uh, relevant in the context of the close and this is what drives it. Is this a disconnect? Yes, it is a disconnect and, and, and it, it pertains to underlying uh, trends of how the digital economy is, uh, is perhaps feeding into some of the uh, inequalities uh, that we've seen uh, uh, in, in, in the context of uh, growth. And this is a very, very big question and it is one that economists are really, really struggling with, but it is a, a correct observation. There is an increase in inequality and it is driving by the big firms simply becoming bigger. Thank you. Billy, now you have, uh, you know, you can even answer two questions if you want. <laughs> uh, those who know me know I can't answer two questions in one minute. I can't answer one question in one minute. Um, but I will talk about being champions for financial education in the school. You know, that 
start local, start with the school district where you live, use data to make the case and, and, and simply say to the superintendent, the principal, uh, if you know others that are involved, the school boards and say, why are you withholding this from my child, from my student, from my children, and, and outline the benefits. The data are clear on this uh, when it's effective, but you have to concede that the minimum standard for what should be called financial education is a pretty high bar. It's not financial information. It's not tips. It's not a couple of workshops and you're finished. It is a comprehensive uh, ex learning experience that you know, you want to build the foundation on and begin from there. And through that, hopefully we can begin to, to answer one of these other questions, uh, build the confidence necessary so that individuals can begin to navigate the system and recognize those obstacles and which ones are person made, which ones are, are put in place by the corporate sector, which ones are put in place by government and be able to begin to advocate for that or at least have the language to understand that this is a complex system that you're trying to navigate. And it's not just about consumption and we need to stop blaming individual consumption on the, uh, the entirety of the problems of the financial ecosystem that we live in. I mean, COVID is a perfect example of that. You know, we could sit in our lovely offices and say, well, you, you spit yourself out of these problems. Um, you know, you shouldn't have chosen the tourism industry for a career. You know, instead of putting the blame on the individual, let's look at access to quality information and help people begin to navigate a complicated system. Thank you very much. I have to say that, uh, you know, this is a great way to end the, the webinar. This is going to be the last webinar of the year. So we restart in January in 2021. And I have a wish for the new year and for the holidays, which is that all of your recommendations come through. So first of all, thank you very much to the speaker, this extraordinary group today. Thank you very much for the people who have uh, listened and follow us online today. And I wish all of you a very happy holiday season. Thank you very much and looking forward to seeing all of you again in the new year.